Walker for your gracious invitation for me to come and present at this year's lectureship. Uh, I am greatly appreciative of this opportunity. I only have 26 minutes now, so um, I'm going to get right into it because I've been told I was a... Uh, oh, perfect. He said, I get a, a few more minutes. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> All right, I'll just get right into it. He, he gave me the subject on this, this afternoon, the real prosperity doctrine. The real prosperity doctrine. And the text is going to come primarily from Proverbs chapter 28. And the verse is 13. And it reads, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. If we're honest with ourselves, I think that we can all say that we want to prosper. Amen, somebody. But my question to you this afternoon is, what kind of prosperity are you seeking? The world often defines prosperity in terms of material wealth, Financial success, external achievements, abundance of money and possessions, the accumulation of material goods, high social status, career advancement, fame and recognition. And the sad reality is that this worldly prosperity has infiltrated the church. True Christianity has been hijacked by the false teachings of the prosperity gospel. Are y'all with me? Let me tell you a little bit about the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel, also known as that uh, health and wealth gospel, they teach that faith is directly related to financial gain and material blessings. The prosperity gospel teaches that, that God primarily desires his followers to be materially wealthy and financially successful. This gospel, uh, this false gospel teaches that believers can speak affirmations into their life that will result in some physical blessings. This false gospel says you are, if you are financially improv improvished, it's because you are spiritually improvished. So then my question is this, prosperity preacher, if this is true, what, what, what do we do with Jesus? Because the Bible tells me that the birds have nests and the foxes have holes, but, but the son of man has what? Nowhere to lay his head. So, so if this false gospel is true, what do you do with Jesus who was poor and lived in poverty? And the Bible says he was a, a, a man from where? Nazareth. And what did they say about Nazareth? Oh, nothing good comes from Nazareth. So, so what do you do with Jesus who lived his life in poverty? Prosperity preacher, what do you do with the first century church? The church of Jerusalem. I say that this was a, a, a loving church, but not the wisest church. Because they did something when they first got converted over to Christianity. The Bible says that they took all their possessions, all their belongings, and they looked out in their community. And if they saw anybody in need, what did they do? They gave it. They gave their possessions. They gave their money to anyone who had need. This wasn't the, the wisest thing, but it was the loving thing. And, and if you know anything about Paul's writing to the church in Galatia. He wrote to this church and he said, hey, there's a church over in Jerusalem. This is a, a Jewish church. I know you're a Gentile church in Galatia, but this this Jewish fellowship in Jerusalem, they're suffering poverty and persecution. They need some help. So I need you to gather your financial resources so I can send aid to the church in Jerusalem. Prosperity preacher, what do you do with the Christians in Jerusalem who were poor? in need of financial assistance, dare you say they lacked faith? Dare you say they were spiritually impoverished? Are y'all with me this afternoon? Actual prosperity is living a, a meaningful life. Oh, that's, that's prosperity. Actual prosperity is, is having emotional well-being. 
When God has, has, has woke you up in your right mind, that's prosperity. Amen, somebody. Actual prosperity is having healthy relationships, having purpose, having joy, having contentment, having spiritual growth and maturity. That's prosperity. But true prosperity flows from a close relationship with God. And this prosperity involves confessing our sins and transgressions to God and to one another. When was the last time someone in the church confessed their sins to you? When when was the last time that you took an inventory of your sins and you called someone in the church? You said, hey, brother, I'm struggling. Hmm. When was the last time you confessed your sins to God? When was the last time? When was the last time that you witnessed your preacher confess his sins to the congregation? When was the last time that you witnessed the elders and the deacons confess their sins to the congregation? Y'all are quiet. Hmm. In the church, we have created this culture of condemnation instead of a culture of confession. I submit to you today that the church is, is, is lacking in our uh, ability to confess due to fear of judgment. Why aren't people confessing their sins? They don't want to be judged. In fact, let me tell you something. If they are confessing them se- their sins, then they've already judged themselves. They've already examined that that my life is not according to the will of God. And I need to I need to confess my faults, my transgressions to my community of faith. They've already condemned themselves. But they fear being condemned again from the community of faith. Are you all with me? Why don't people confess their sins? There's this fear of judgment, fear of condemnation. But there's also this fear of a ruined reputation. Oh, what would happen if the preacher confesses his sin to the congregation? Oh, because we all struggle. Would he still have a job? Would he still have a name worth mentioning in the fellowship, in the brotherhood? Are y'all with me? Can I be honest? Can we be transparent? What would happen if someone confessed in your Congregation. Are people allowed to be vulnerable? Are they allowed to be open and transparent with their struggles? They don't confess because sometimes we have pride and self righteousness. Pride and self righteousness, where we want to appear like we got it all together. And you know what that does? That prevents people from coming to the church because they realize they don't have it all together. But when we portray ourselves and project to others that we have it all together, that we've overcome our sins, we've overcome our temptations, it's a turnoff. People don't think it's safe to confess their sins. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, 23, Paul says, some have sinned. Some of y'all know your Bible. He says, everybody has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every, that means I have sinned and I continue to sin. You have sinned and you continue to sin. But are you willing to admit it? I don't care how long you've been in the church, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you still struggle with sin. I don't care how many Bible verses you can quote, you still struggle with sin. Are y'all with me? All have sinned 
and fallen short. When there is sin in our lives, what is your response to your sin? What do you do with it? Do you rationalize it? Do you justify it? Do do you blame someone else? Well, if you didn't do this or you didn't say that, then I wouldn't have done this or said that. What do you do with the sin in your life? We don't dismiss the sin of our in our life, church. We deal with it. We don't avoid it. We address it. We don't we don't we don't cover it. We confront it head on. Amen. We don't conceal it. We confess it. Any of you heard of uh, AA meetings? Okay. I know some of y'all are really holy and you don't struggle with alcoholism. But in an AA meeting, if you've never been there, let me tell you what happens. You walk into an AA meeting and you sit down and you're in a circle with several people, sometimes 10, 20, 30. And they go around and they all state their name. Then it comes around to you. And this is this is what traditionally happens. Hi, my name is Joshua Dubois. And I'm an alcoholic. And you know what they do? (laughs) Hi, Joshua. No condemnation, no judgment. No criticism. No side eye, no, no ruined reputation. Just support. And guess how many times they do this? Every single time they meet. They're confessing their sins to one another. And this isn't a religious institution. This isn't the church. Guess how many members they have here in the U.S.? 1.3 million. 1.3 million, and they can come together in community and confess their sins to one another without judgment. Are y'all with me? Here's a side note. Here's a side note. Do you know what the younger generation is looking for in a church community? Let me tell you, they're looking for transparency. They're looking for honesty. They're looking for us to be vulnerable. Because when they come through those doors, they're coming with a lot of abuse, a lot of trauma, a lot of addiction. And they want to be in a place where they feel they can be honest about what they're struggling with. And if they get the impression that they're going to be judged, dismissed and rejected, they're walking back out. And I'm telling you this because there's a GCU student who attends the Vineyard Church of Christ. And she told me, she said, I've been in the church my whole life. And she said, I've never seen anyone come forward during the invitation and confess a sin. That's a problem. They're looking for authenticity and an honest faith. Are y'all with me? Confessing sin acknowledges that that we have missed God's moral standard. Confessing sin acknowledges that, that we agree with God's definition of what is morally right and morally wrong. Confessing sin acknowledges that we are behaving in a manner that violates God's statutes. Confessing sin acknowledges that God has a moral expectation that I am unable to keep. Confessing sin says I agree with God. When God doesn't agree with me. Proverbs 28, 13. Whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Unconfessed sin hinders our prosperity. Is that not what Solomon is saying? So hiding or covering up our transgressions will ultimately ultimately lead to to negative consequences. That that phrase will not prosper in the Hebrew. It means to lack the blessings of God's favor. 
Will not prosper means to be without the guidance of God. Will not prosper means to live in opposition to God's principles. So what is Solomon doing? He says a person who conceals or or hides their sin, he's reflecting on the consequences of doing so. He says they will not prosper. Can I give you a psychological perspective? When we have unconfessed sin in our lives, it creates in our heart psychological turmoil. Amen, amen, amen. When, when we have unconfessed sin in our, in our lives, it often manifests itself in anxiety disorders. It often manifests itself in depression and hopelessness, despair and suicidal ideation because it's eaten us alive. When we have unconfessed sin in our lives, it causes us to become socially distant. It makes us feel like we're we're spiritually distant from God. It makes it hard to pray, hard to worship, hard to study the Bible. Are y'all with me? When we have unconfessed sin in our lives, the psychological turmoil of feeling unloving, of feeling unworthy, and it decreases our self-esteem. We cannot prosper when we don't confess our sins. There's an overwhelming sense of guilt and shame. And don't you know that it actually can result in physical illness, such as headaches, Stomach pain. When Solomon wrote this, I could only imagine that he had his father in mind. Why do you say that? The Psalm Psalm, uh, chapter 32, verses three through five says this. And this is this is David speaking. As a result of his sins, and he had many. But he was still said to be a man after what? God's own heart. And so this is a glimpse into the heart of David as he examines the sin in his life. Watch what he says. I want you to to identify the psychological suffering that he's experienced. He says this, for when I kept silent, when, when I refused to confess my sin and my transgression, he says, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day. Do you know what it's like to groan all day long? That's pain. That's psychological suffering. Verse four, for for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. I couldn't sleep. There was so much sin in my life. You ever had insomnia? You ever went to sleep but couldn't stay asleep? Hmm. He says, my strength was was dried up as the heat of summer. Verse five, I acknowledged my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And what you forgave me, the iniquity of my sin. Selah, breathe. Mm. So we know if we conceal our sin and and we don't confess it, there's psychological suffering. But I want to tell you this afternoon that if we confess our sin, acknowledge our sin, let God know that we have sin, there's psychological relief. Confessing sin can bring about what we call in therapy a catharsis, right? That's an emotional release. God, I've sinned against you and I feel guilty. I feel shamed. I feel embarrassed and I'm sorry. God, please forgive me. I didn't mean to break your heart as a result of my behavior. I feel horrible. My heart is broken. It's contrite. Emotional release. Confessing sin can bring about increased self-awareness. Confession requires that we reflect on our thoughts, on our attitudes, on our behavior and take responsibility. I messed up. I said the wrong thing. I did something I shouldn't have done. We call that emotional intelligence. Increase self-awareness. There's honesty and integrity. 
when we're honest with ourselves. I'm not perfect. I don't have it all together. Someday, every day is a temptation for me. Are you honest with yourself? Confessing sin can bring about bravery and vulnerability. It takes courage for you to face your own mistakes and admit them to God and to others. You know, being vulnerable is the, is the most courageous thing that you can do to tell someone, hey, I have sinned. That's brave. That's strength. Hmm. Confession of sin. If we're not careful, we can put this in the category of rule keeping. (laughs) Confession of sin is not about having another rule or another commandment. Confession of sin is actually about relationship. Are y'all with me? When confession is about rules, we're simply reporting our sin. Hmm. When confession is about relationship, then we are repenting of our sin. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying confession precedes transformation. He says true confession is remorse and repentance. And if we get into the category of keeping rules and making confession something that is more legalistic than than relational. We take out the remorse. And it becomes something we just check the box. The remorse means I feel guilty. That 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 my sin hurts me because I know that I've hurt God. And and I love God so much. The last thing I want to do is hurt him. So when I know that I've letting him down, I've letting myself down and I feel bad about it. Y'all are quiet. Remorse is a deep sense of sorrow and regret for wrongdoing. A genuine sadness for having acted contrary to the will of God. Confession without genuine remorse and repentance becomes superficial rule keeping. I'm almost done. Why do we confess? What's, what, what's the reason For our confession, I'm glad you asked. It is God's mercy that opens our heart to confession and repentance. It is God's mercy and his love that opens our heart to confession and repentance. See, we've gotten it backwards. Amen. We often guilt people into confession and repentance. Can we be honest? We often condemn people into confession and repentance. We reject people into confession and repentance. And we judge people into confession and repentance. There was a brother, dear to my heart. He struggles with fornication. Known him for years, and he is a phenomenal preacher. He has has an authentic, genuine heart, but that's just his temptation. And so he reaches out to me from time to time and he says, brother, I'm calling you because I need you to pray for me because I'm struggling. And so I asked him, I said, brother, you know, I'm, I'm here for you. I'm your accountability partner. I'll pray with you. But, but have you talked to the leaders at the church? Do you have a support group at the church? And he said, brother, I, I wish I did, but I don't. And I said, well, what would happen if you confess your sin and your struggle to them? He said it would be social suicide. I'll be rejected. I'll be judged. I'll be exiled. And so I come to you. Are y'all with me? So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying an environment conducive to confession and repentance is necessary. Right? Romans chapter 2, verse 24 says this. This is the New Living Translation. I like this translation for this particular verse. He says, Don't you see how wonderfully kind, tolerant and patient God is with you? 
Does this mean nothing to you? Can't you see that his kindness is intended to turn you from your sin? Hmm. His kindness, his gentleness, his patience, his mercy. He's being so gracious and loving to you. And he's saying the result of that should be what? Repentance. I don't have to beat you into repentance. I don't have to condemn you into repentance. God is saying, I'm using my rich mercy and grace to get you to repent. And so what does that say about the environment that we should have as a community of faith? When people struggle, that the environment should be loving. If people aren't coming forth and and confessing their sins and asking the church for help because everybody has sinned. And if they're not coming to us, then we have to question our environment. Is our environment loving? Is our environment comforting? Are we offering guidance in this environment with people who struggle with sin? Are we being empathetic? Are we being understanding? Are we being supportive? And are we following up with them after they confess? Confession implies certain theological truths about God. Here's a few. When we confess, we are acknowledging the reality of God's existence and his authority over our life. Right, right. We, 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 we want God to be our savior, but we don't want him to be our king. But when you confess your sins, you're saying, God, yes, I, I love you and welcome you as my savior, but you also have authority over my life. Hmm. In confessing, we believe that God is omniscient, which means he knows about our sin already. And he just wants us to confess it to him because we benefit from that. Are y'all with me? When we confess, we recognize that God is holy, that God is righteous, and that we have fallen short of his expectations. And so it's us telling God, God, I realize that you're holy, that you're perfect, that you're sinless. And I am totally dependent on your grace and mercy. Forgive me of my sin. We admit our need for his grace In his mercy, confession reflects our belief in God's mercy. Confession demonstrates our understanding of God's willingness to extend his grace and mercy towards us. Got two minutes for the invitation. I appreciate that. Ephesians. Chapter two. Verse number four. Paul starts off with. But, oh, it's a, and it's a big but. Amen, somebody. He says, but God, who is what? Rich in what? Mercy. Because of his great love. Hmm. Mercy and love go hand in hand. You, you can't have love and no mercy. You can't have mercy without love. And so Paul is saying, God, who is rich in mercy, why is he rich in mercy? Because he's rich in love. And he loved us with this love. Watch this. Even when we were what? Dead in our trespasses. God loved us when we were spiritually dead. Dead. God loved us when we were wallowing in our sin. God loved us in our rebellion. God loved us when we hated him. Oh, that's love. That's great love. Even when we were dead, he made us alive. Oh, he performed spiritual CPR. Oh, we were on life support. We, we had stopped breathing. We had flatlined, and he resuscitated us. Through whom? Through Jesus the Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. Hmm. We were dead in our trespasses, and he, he what? He made us alive. We couldn't do it ourselves. He made us alive. 
He quickened us. He put the, the, the spiritual blood back in our va- veins, the, the spiritual breath back in our loves. He raised us from the dead. He made us alive together with Christ. He says, by grace you have been saved, and he's raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What are you saying? He's saying this. God's mercy is so rich. His love is so rich that he has given us everything that he's given his son, Jesus. Right? He says we were once dead in our sins and our trespasses, but he made us alive in Christ He's saying that 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 Jesus, yeah, he he took the penalty of our sin, the consequence of our sin to the cross. And it resulted in his crucifixion and his death. And then he was buried. And the Bible says, hallelujah, he was what? Raised the third day. And so Paul is saying, just as Jesus died because of sin, God looked down and saw that you were dead in your sin, and he made you alive by giving you an opportunity to respond to the gospel. And when you responded to the gospel, there was a a, a death and a birth that took place simultaneously. The watery grave of of baptism is not only a grave, it's a birth canal. Are y'all with me? You're dead and alive. Just in a moment. And he says this. Jesus was resurrected. If you obey the gospel. You're going to die physically. But Jesus's tomb was empty. Your tomb is going to be empty. And he says Jesus is is now alive in heaven. When you die. You're going to be where? Alive in heaven. If you are in Christ Jesus, why? Because of God's great mercy and his great love in which he loved us with. Are you here this afternoon? Have you given your life to Christ? Have you have you repented of your sins? Have you confessed that Jesus Christ is the son of God? Have you have you responded to the gospel, which is the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus? What is baptism? Baptism is the gospel in action. Amen. If you're here and your sins have not been forgiven, if you're here and you have not confessed Jesus, then you're still dead in your trespasses. And what God is doing right now in this moment, he's reaching his hand out to you and he's saying, trust me with your soul. Believe in what my son had done on the cross so that I can make you alive again. And when I resuscitate you, you're going to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. Amen, somebody. And you'll have a home in in heaven with God himself. If you're here and you're in need of anything, if you need prayer, 